In a recent paper, we discuss how some individuals see increased cholesterol levels after going on a low-carb diet. In fact, this seems closely related to how lean these individuals are alongside common markers for good metabolic health. This brings up some very big questions. Just how high can cholesterol levels go in this situation? Is it likely the leanest of these folks are just consuming the most saturated fat? And perhaps most importantly, would we find development of heart disease in the most extreme cases? Well, I'm happy to say we've just released a new comprehensive case study that may give us some interesting data on all these questions and more. Before we get started, I need to give a couple of important disclaimers. One, this video does not constitute medical advice. And two, we remind viewers that existing guidelines and major institutions focused on heart disease strongly advise against high cholesterol levels. Our case study centers around a 26-year-old male who adopted a ketogenic diet to manage severe ulcerative colitis. This diet strategy has worked remarkably well for his treatment, but it also resulted in a substantial increase in his LDL cholesterol, a well-regarded risk factor for heart disease. However, he likewise saw his HDL cholesterol rise and triglycerides fall, and these are two markers associated with a low risk of heart disease. We discussed this triad of high LDL, high HDL, and low triglycerides in our prior paper around this profile we refer to as lean mass hyperresponders. And yes, our patient certainly fits this profile as well. Don't worry if you're new to this, we'll post a link to that paper down below. This brings us to the first key question. Just how high can these cholesterol levels go in this situation? In the case of our patient, his LDL levels increased from 95 before the keto diet to as high as 545 milligrams per deciliter at its peak. These levels are rarely seen save some extreme examples of the genetic disease familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH. And unfortunately, for those born with FH at these levels, there is typically a very rapid development of plaque in the arteries, leading to the onset of clinical heart disease in very early childhood. Notably, the patient also had advanced genetic testing, such as whole exome sequencing and heart disease risk assessment, but no genetic mutations were found that could explain these levels. For some further background, in our prior paper, we showed an inverse association between BMI and LDL cholesterol in the context of a low-carb diet. This means it predicted leaner people who would appear to be more likely to develop high LDL on a low-carb diet. We also showed that adding back some carbohydrates could reverse the high LDL. This falls in line with our patient. In an effort to reduce his LDL, he tried on multiple occasions to increase carbohydrate intake and come off his ketogenic diet, but every time he did so, he had a relapse of his inflammatory bowel disease. However, as the inflammatory bowel disease remained in remission and he was able to gain weight, thus increasing his BMI, his LDL cholesterol decreased. Okay, but is it possible this is all just high consumption of saturated fat? Many speculate that these increased levels of LDL cholesterol with low carb can simply be attributed to greater consumption of saturated fat. Yet as I've just alluded to, this is another area our patient can provide some additional insight. His low carb diet is more Mediterranean style, with emphasis on fatty seafood, extra virgin olive oil, and low carb fruits and vegetables and thus his consumption of unsaturated fat typically exceeded 82% of total fat intake, with saturated fat being less than 18%. However, in his final test of October 2021, he changed his diet to one with a much higher proportion of saturated fat at 45%. Yet this threefold increase in relative saturated fat intake had little impact on resulting LDL cholesterol in the context of his moderate increase in BMI. Simply put, in this patient, BMI dominated over saturated fat and dietary cholesterol consumption in determining LDL levels. Lastly, will these extreme levels of LDL cholesterol demonstrate rapid progression of arterial plaque? Throughout the study period, the patient and his care team were especially interested in assessing his risk. Given available data on FH patients with cholesterol levels this high, there was understandably a concern that at least some detectable plaque would have developed since he began the diet almost three years ago. The patient scheduled a CT angiogram, which provides an advanced high-resolution scan for the heart and its surrounding arteries. CCTAs can easily pick up plaque volume even at very small sizes. In the case of our patient, 
The scan demonstrated no coronary artery disease. All cross-sectional views showed no plaque volume of any kind, and this was confirmed by the independent analysis of three different cardiac imaging specialists. But is this surprising or to be expected after only 2.5 years of extremely high LDL? Unfortunately, the limitation of our current science is there are very little CCTA data available for comparison to our patient. However, our case report does cite a published case series including a baby diagnosed with homozygous FH and an LDL of 548, who started multiple medications at around age 2 to lower these levels. With further treatment, his doctors were able to get his LDL to 139, but in spite of these interventions, the patient's first CT angiogram at age 8 identified plaque buildup in multiple arteries. This comparison is interesting because, again, both this homozygous FH patient and our patient had a similar two-year exposure to LDL levels around 500, and our patient had the additional exposure to normal LDL for over two decades of life. And yet, it was the older lean mass hyperresponder patient who exhibited the complete absence of detectable plaque. While these data on our patient are comprehensive and provide potential new insights, they are limited in scope and time span. It's certainly possible this patient is an outlier, or that their progression of plaque will take place later, or many other such possibilities. Even if this risk profile in the short term turns out to be in striking contrast to those with FH, it only further underscores the need for more research on this phenomenon overall. Fortunately, there is also an upcoming prospective study for 100 lean mass hyperresponders that will likewise employ CT angiography. There's a lot more in this case study than we cover here, so be sure to read it from the link in the description down below. And, as always, thank you for watching.